I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. started when God said, light up the darkness, and the world was filled with light and life. But we, we wanted more. And so was severed our lifeline to God. And for thousands of years, we tried to earn our way back through prayers and burnt offerings and sacrifices, but nothing was ever good enough. We still fell short. But oh, how he loves us, longs for relationship with us once again. So he sent us his son, Christ, the image of the invisible God. God displayed his love for mankind. A declaration through his son, Jesus, who brought healing, hope, chance for salvation.
One more time, give it up for all those actors and everybody. You look wonderful. Look at your neighbor and tell them, say, you clean up nice. You really look great today. You can be seated on campuses, Florida, well and online, Ferguson, everybody. I'm excited. You know, hell really messed up when they did what they did to Jesus, killed him on that cross. And as you just saw, I won't retell that whole story, but it's just amazing how it, sometimes it looks like one thing is happening, and underneath or behind the scenes, something else is happening. When they crucified Jesus, and he hung there between two thieves, and he dies, and they think it's over, and he winds up in hell, and hell's throwing a party. I mean, they got Jack and Coke, and uh, they had legalized marijuana way before any other states had done it, and they're just partying like crazy, but all of a sudden now, on that first Sunday morning, uh, there's just this eerie feeling, this creepy feeling where Jesus takes back everything the devil ever stole, and he defeats the devil right there. Somebody ought to shout amen. He took the keys to death, the hell, and the grave. He brought it back and bought our freedom. Isn't that wonderful? 
Every year, uh, you know, of course, uh, some of you come and some first time, every year there's different people. And I always, as, as I started the church 19 years ago, I was kind of doing the math yesterday and I thought, how, how many of these have I done sermons in 19 years? And I kind of did, did the average of it and I've, I've done over 5,000 sermons. You'd actually think I'd be better at this by now. And I was thinking about the different ways to tell the story. And every year, one of my concerns is, is this, is like that you would come and you'd be like, is this what they talk about all year? You know, I mean, every week is like Jesus dies, comes back. Da, da, da. You know, there are other things you talk about. And of course, I think our, our, our team did a great job, again, telling that story. But I want to dive just a little bit into the, the Garden of Gethsemane just a little bit. And I, want, I want to set this up, this context, in Matthew 26, verse 37. It said, taking with him Peter and the two sons, Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul, my soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. He goes on a little further and he fell to his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I want to go back to that first part we read a second ago where it says, my soul is sorrowful. Think about this. Jesus knows, you know, first of all, you know, the story of the Godhead Trinity confuses some people. It's like, hey, do you have three gods or do you have one God? We have one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But now in heaven, now we know, and we saw that the snake comes into the garden and now the whole world disrupts and we all blame Adam and Eve. How many of y'all hate that they did that? Raise your hand. If you're like, I hate that they did that. But how many of y'all are pretty sure if you'd have been there, you'd have probably screwed it up too. Go ahead. Come on, raise your hand, right? So we know that Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, he comes back and he buys back with the first Adam fails to successfully navigate. And now Jesus says, you know what? I've got to put on an earth suit. And now he's born with this precious virgin Mary. And he comes back and for 33 years now, Jesus spends his life here in the earth realm, living, being tempted just like you are, tempted to lie, tempted to cheat, tempted to steal, all the list. It says at all points he was tempted like us without sin. So you got to remember that that he's God, but yet he's born of this person. So he's, he's a real person with real feelings. And he felt those nails. And sometimes people talk about, you know, the the Christian world is is a bloody religion. And why do you guys talk about that? I think that it needs to be addressed. And we need to keep it in the forefront of our mind that this wasn't no cakewalk. This guy, Jesus Christ, paid for sins that he did not commit and he felt it. And today we get to feel it through freedom. That's right. Go ahead. Give it up at all the campuses. But, but I love that part where it says, you know, he's having mental anguish. And he says, hey, if there's any way, let this cup pass for me. Verse 40 he says, and he, he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. He wanted them to, to pray. He needed some friends. And he said to Peter, could not you watch with me one hour? Come on, man. Watch and pray that we don't enter into temptation. And, and then I love this. It says, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of y'all feel the same way? Like your heart's good, your head's jacked up. Let's try it. Bunch of liars over here. Anybody, your heart's good, but your head's messed up. So he says, my, my spirit's willing, God. Like, like Jesus, I want to help you. I wanted to pray, but man, my eyes got really heavy and I couldn't do it. So we see something here. We see that Jesus is agony. He's in distress. He knows tomorrow morning they're coming to kill me. I, I, I can't sleep. By the way, there was no Lunesta. There was no Tylenol PM. There was no Xanax, no Prozac. He's dealing with all of this pressure and the pressure is overwhelming his mind. And so my point is to this, is this. Do you remember a while ago in the video, you know, where they put the crown of thorns, you know, and our team did that and they so gently did that. And I, I, I like the way they did it, but yet I don't like the way they did it because I mean, it wasn't like this gentle thing. Like, no, they shoved and they pierced his head with these long, 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 long thorns that went through his head. Why did he do that? He did it because he knew that you and I, most of the problems that we would have would be right here. How many of the biggest problem you really do have is your mind? Your mind sometimes thinks the worst. You see an ambulance. Oh God, I hope it's not the kids. Raise your hand. 
And you think the worst case scenario. So by his stripes were healed, we know that. But those thorns that were on his head was for the mental anguish that you and I would go through. And he would say, hey, I don't want you to have to go through what I went through. So I'm going to teach you in my word and I'm going to deliver you. And you're going to go through some stuff. But you're not just going to go through. You're actually going to something. And on the way to it, there's going to be some trouble. There's going to be some ups. There's going to be some downs. There's going to be some highs. There's going to be some lows. There's just problems. Anybody in here married? Raise your hand. It's, 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 it's beautiful. <laughs> it's actually brutal is what it is. Right? So you know this. So in life, there's ups, there's downs. We have good times. We have bad times. And so I want to really draw the picture today that Jesus is really, really, he's sweating drops of blood at this point. He's having a panic attack. He's having anxiety disorders. He's overwhelmed with emotions. His frontal lobe is going crazy. His amygdala is going on. The fight or flight is hitting him like crazy. He's being triggered right now. And he looks to his friends and says, hey, you, can't you help me? And they can't help him. And sometimes we're looking in all the wrong spaces and places for help. Yes, friends are good. You got good friends and bad friends. All the time when we're making cheers, when some of my friends are here and I just joke and even, and I'll say, hey, you know, two good, two good friends wish they were here. <laughs> just as a joke. So we got all of our good friends. He's got his good friends around him and they can't support him emotionally. And I would like to say in 2023, like it is an emotional time. Back when you were younger, how many of you were younger? You, you just nod at me if you're arthritic. You're like, yeah, I, I was. When you were younger, we could agree to disagree. And it didn't mean I had to shoot you. It didn't mean I had to kill you. It didn't mean I had to hate you. You might be this party and you might be that party. But at the end of the day, I mean, we were all Americans. Uh, the 4th of July, we came. Lee Greenwood sang his song. And tomorrow, everything was going to work for all my life. And I had to die again all my children and my wife. And I think my lucky stars, I'll be living here today. Take that away. And the red ones, the blue ones, the pink ones. We know the drill. We came together. But the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Not only the enemy, but the inner me. And so there's this psychosis going on, and there's this, this adrenaline going on, and there's this psychology going on right now that people think that, oh, if you don't agree with me, then I've got to kill you. And I'm telling you, we got to go back to love. And what was love? Nails didn't hold him on the cross. Love held him on the cross. And what the world needs now is for us, the church, the body of Christ, to come together and get it together and realize we're all not just going through something together. We're going to something together. If we'll stay strong, bold, and courageous and keep our eyes on the prize instead of the problem, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. No weapon formed against us will prosper and every tongue that rises up against us will be cut off and shown to be in the world. Who am I talking to today? But the problem is, this preaching is very amped up and you just got pumped up. You're like, yeah, let's take the hill. <laughs> but have you ever been alone at nighttime and everybody was sleeping but you and it was dark and you were overwhelmed and you're trying to work through it? Out of the 5,000 sermons that I told you I preached, I was thinking about it yesterday on Southwest Airlines flying from Fort Lauderdale to here. And I thought out of those 5,000 sermons, the ones that connected with people were the ones that I knew. Nobody told me about it. I had been through it. And so I could tell you how to get out of it because I had been where you are. I've been divorced. I've walked into St. Anthony's Hospital five miles from here and watch my dad die at 56 years old. It's way too young. I'm 53. I know what you're thinking. My God, you don't look a day over 52. Thank you. <laughs> but, but, but while all the pain and struggle and divorce and heartache and building churches is a pain and building nine of them and multi-site, multi-state, multi, multi, -state, multi you, 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 you darned if you do, you darned if you don't, you don't say enough of this, you, did, you didn't wear this, you didn't do that. At some point, I got to go, wait, what I've got to do is keep my eyes on the main thing. And if I can point you to the where I was and what Jesus did for me, somebody ought to shout amen. That goes back to that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I 
once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. I'm telling you, this is what Jesus was going through in the garden. He was going through what you're going through. When you're worried about your son and your daughter, because they're coming to you and telling you that they're having suicidal thoughts. I get no less than 10 of those conversations a week because kids are living in a world that's it's really jacked up. When you were little, it was leave it to beaver. It was the Brady Bunch. And like if you were really devilish, like if you were a heathen, like you watched Three is Company, but your parents, you had to hide it. And if you were a pervert, you watched Benny Hill while your parents were sleeping. And I only know this because my friends told me about it. Sorry, Harry. Okay. When you were a little kid, you had to pay for porn and water was free. And now on every little phone, it's free, but we have to pay for the water. And I'm here to tell you that the water is found here. And this is what Jesus demonstrated when the woman at the well was jacked up. He hadn't died yet. She came to get water out of the well and she didn't know who he was. But he was Jesus, the kinsman redeemer. Listen to me today. And Jesus starts a conversation with her. By the way, you need to start conversations with yourself and you need to start conversations with other people about Jesus because the way we get out of here is we put Jesus first place and Jesus is found in his word and Jesus is found in the local church because all of these friends that you have that went to sleep on you, that tried to do what they could do, but they couldn't do much because they didn't have the anointing to remove burdens and destroy yokes because that's Jesus' job. Conversations happen at work. Jesus is at the water cooler. She comes to get water. He looks at her, starts up a conversation. Everybody's like, oh, don't you know that she is a bad person, that she has all these different lovers, and, and everybody's accusing because that's what the devil comes to accuse you. He might have even told you earlier when a campus pastor at one of the campuses told you, you know, it all, you know, why don't you pray this prayer? That doesn't belong to you. You don't even really want to be here. And so by the end of this, my goal is to give you one more opportunity to make the smartest decision in your life, and I will in seven minutes and nine seconds from now. But Jesus looks at her while everybody's accusing her. And I guarantee you she was accusing herself. And Jesus starts writing in, in the, on the ground in the sand. And we don't know what he's writing. Could have been the sins of the other people. Could have been names and addresses. I don't know. It could have been their Google search history. I don't know. I just know that everybody left and it was just Jesus again and the woman. And that's where it's always going to boil down to. Because you're still going to go through stuff. If you're married, you have kids, you live in America, and you're breathing, every day you're going to deal with problems. But the problem shouldn't define us. The problem should make us go, wait a minute, I got a problem, but I actually have a promise, and the promise is bigger than the problem, and I got to get my right mind right, and I'm not going to be emotionally overwhelmed. I'm not going to be crushed in anguish. I'm, I'm not going to try to express all my passion to my friends because they can't help me, and Paxil can only do so much, and Zoloft can only do so much, and Xanax can only do so much. The stress is going to kill me. No, 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 wait a minute. That was all on Jesus. And now I have the mind of Christ. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not like, oh, yeah, if you pray this prayer, it's like, and it's all good now. It's not. We all have troubles. We all have trials. But the thing is, we go through it. Because the Bible said that God works all things together for the good of those that love the Lord. He works all things, even the bad stuff, the divorce, the trial, the setback, the cancer, the stress. It, it, you know, if you have an undisciplined mind, you have a stream of anxious, worryful, stressful thoughts. It actually damages your brain. And some of you, your brain, your mind needs to be healed. I actually start a series next week on that. I did about four weeks. You could get on the Faith Church app and watch it about a year ago with my friend. He's a leading neurosurgeon in America, one of my dear and closest friends. And we talked about the mind and the brain. And you have a mind. Raise your hand if you've got a mind. Raise your hand. Uh, raise your hand if, like, you're pretty sure yours is bigger than the person next to you. Raise your hand. It's a big mind. But when we started studying the mind and the will and the emotions, and we started out figuring out what triggers things and what emotions kick in, 
We realize that the most important thing that you've got to get out first is your head. When you were born and you were a baby, raise your hand if you were a baby at one point. Raise your hand if you were a really cute baby. Look at your neighbor and say, well, you're ugly now, but I'd like to see the baby pictures. Are you sure you're ugly now? The doctor concerns himself mostly at birth that you come out head first. If not, you're breached. You got to get your head out first. So in your life, in my life, we've got to get our head out first. But if you don't get your head out and if you undisciplined thoughts, you're always reacting to something instead of saying, wait a minute, listen, I'm going to change the way I think. And if I can change the way I think, then I can change the way I live. So now I'm not like a Christian and like I do everything right. No, God did everything right. I'm still jacked up and I'm still messed up. So my condition to the cross is jacked, but my position in the cross is right. So even when I do wrong, his grace is sufficient. Here's what the enemy tries to do. When you're overwhelmed like Jesus was, what did he do? He started talking to the father. He tried to get his friends to pray with him, but they were kind of like Job's friends. They were only so good. It's like my friends on Facebook. I have like 200,000 friends on Facebook. I'm not sure we're really friends. I don't know these 200,000 people. But I do have some friends that are friends. I mean, Avery's in my phone and Kat's in my phone and Micah's in my phone and, uh, and Mr. Amini's in my phone. And, and I got friends. You're, you're, you're my friends. I, I, I know you. We're, we're, but I, I'm mostly your pastor. But what I want you to realize and take away from the sermon today, well, in Ferguson, Florida, wherever you're at, is what you're going through is normal if you've got a brain. But how you respond to all these triggers and everything that's going on in the world has everything to do with your ability to keep your mind right. Because if you can keep your mind right, you can keep your heart right. If you can keep your heart right, you can keep your mouth right. Why? Because the Bible said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Another question I have for you. Here, here's a big question for you. Have you ever said something to somebody you loved and you wish you hadn't have said it? We do it all the time. Have you ever sent the text, zoom, and realized, man, I wish I could get that back. Maybe I could run to their phone, but I don't know their code. Get rid of it. These are all conversations that I've had with myself. Why do we do that? We're human. We're normal. We do stupid stuff. But the fact is we're forgiven. We're not stupid. We do stupid stuff. So we need to be smart enough to realize that the enemy is trying to keep you from God and trying to keep you from receiving God's blessing in your life. And so now you really have, here's what's happening. You're underestimating who you're becoming. I want to say that again because I want you to get it. You're underestimating who you're becoming. But you don't know, man, I'm 63. Who am I becoming? Listen, Abraham was up in his 90s before God actually used him. Colonel Sanders did not invent the secret recipe for crispy chicken and deliver that till the dude was like in his mid-50s or 60s. He was old. By the time he got his money, he didn't have teeth to enjoy the cake. I'm just telling you, what God started in you, that dream that he started in you, all the setbacks and the hell that you've went through, that was the enemy trying to get you to stop. If Jesus had stopped, we wouldn't be here today. But thank God he said, hey, if there's any way, let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And I say that's what we ought to say today is, you know what? I want the will of God for my life. And I, I don't like going through the hell, but by God, I'm going to stick with it. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Come on, give God praise today in his house. Last scripture I want to give you, it's the sake of time, and I'm going to run off to Earth City in a minute and preach and come back and preach and go preach and preach again. And then Kentucky Fried Chicken is sounding good. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10, verse 3, and I'll pick up on this next week. For though we live and walk in the flesh, we are not carrying on the warfare. That's a strong word. It's like war out there of human weapons. For the weapons of our warfare, there it is again, are not physical. They're not weapons of flesh and blood, but they're mighty. Or God, to overthrow destructive strongholds. Inasmuch, here's some line scriptures. Verse five, we need to learn how to refute all the arguments and the theories and the reasoning for every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we must lead every thought and purpose away captive into obedience. 
every thought captive. I'm going to say it two more times. Every thought captive, every thought captive. So we have to realize that sometimes we are captivated by a captive thought. Sometimes our, our brain, and I'll talk about it next week, we develop neural pathways. Your, your brain is made up of what they call neurological neural pathways. And there are neurons that fire together, wire together. And that's why when you watch porn, when you're 12 or 13, that thing released in you. And now those neurons fire together, wire together, and it develops a neurological pathway. Alcohol, any bad behaviors that you have, those things neurologically went there. And now you received a big, huge shot of dopamine and it felt good. But if it's not controlled, it takes you all the way down to where we'll step over you. And I did this last week over some people because they're all just so drugged out on the streets of California. You can't walk down Rodeo Drive anymore. Can't, why? Why? What's going on? I'm not saying this is an anti-drug campaign speech. I'm just saying that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it starts out as a small thought. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm going to destroy my life today. Just don't. How many times have you seen preachers stand up on a stage and it go viral and they go up and say, guys, I'm really, really sorry. And I did something really, really stupid. How many of you have seen this speech? And they're, it's quivering. You feel sorry for them and it's horrible because they're human, by the way. But that didn't just happen then. It's like, oh man, I woke up in bed naked with another woman. I don't even know how it happened. I just woke up and I was there. We don't wake up there. One thought not taken captive leads to a stronghold that overtakes us. Anxiety disorders, anxiety disorder. And again, I preach this because I've been through it. You guys got to remember today, when I went to bed last night, my name was signed to $16 million worth of debt on the church. So, so I go to bed with that every night. The, the electric bills on some of these buildings are $20,000 a month. The, when they go to repave them, they're football fields. And I am an uneducated young man from Missouri. The show me state, Florida. You don't even know anything about this. This is a place and a space to where it's not like really loaded with a bunch of rich people. I wasn't born with a silver fork in my mouth. All I had was a tongue to say, you know what? I've been divorced. I've been betrayed. How about I go try to help somebody with it? And the next thing you know, you wind up helping a lot of people and you want to help more people and you wind up owing $16 million. But somehow when you go to bed at night, you realize that you don't know it, that where God guides, he provides and somehow, some way, he will seem to fund it. And every week, somehow, some way, God sends money from crazy people. I'm talking about people that own the biggest strip clubs in America. Get saved. Go to your church. Send a tithe check. She said, will you take the money? Yes, we'll take the money. Pray over it. Clean it up. Give it to God. Pay the bills. <laughs> and then allow God to sort it out. By the way, sold the strip clubs and is at church today in rural Palm Beach, Florida, because Jesus does the work in their hearts. Somebody ought to give God praise. Don't tell me what God can't do in your life. Don't tell me you're too bound. He who the son, somebody ought to shout amen. He who the son has set free is free indeed. The devil's trying to keep you back from what God's trying to take you to. But, but you got to come out. You got to come out head, head first, head first. Stand with me. That'll encourage me to close. Nobody moving around just yet. I know some of you are like, oh man, I want to go try to beat the traffic because it's going to take me an extra three minutes to get out of here. I have a couple questions before we go. And online and other campuses, I, I, I see the real-time feed in Weldon and Ferguson and Florida and Royal Palm Beach and West Palm Beach and all the churches I forgot. Not, and I forgot about you. I just can't go through all your names. How am going to say today, Pastor David, at some point today, a few things you said really hit home with me. Raise your hand if you like me. It really hit home. Okay, so I want to pray this prayer. One, I want to pray that God's going to do the work in your heart and you realize that, you know what, I need to put church first again. By, by putting God first, it'll be church first as well because the world's pretty jacked up and, and, and together we need to come together at least once a week and say we're going to worship God. And then two, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus if you didn't pray that prayer earlier at any of the campuses because that's the most important thing, that you get Jesus as center of your life. And I promise you, if you put Jesus in the middle of your life, you won't 
ever regret it. <laughs> you're going to love it. It's going to be the coolest thing in the world. Anybody in here, grandparents, raise your hand if you're grandparents. Yeah, grandkids are your reward for not killing your kids. Okay? So, so just hold on. If you got bad kids, better ones are coming. Okay? It's, it's going to be great. But you don't even know what it's like till you get them. I'm saying you don't even know what your life is going to be like. Until you say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn my back on the past and I'm going forward. I know I'm just doing some stupid stuff right now, but I want you to help me. And if you ask God to take one step towards you, I promise you he'll take 27 and he'll be right there with you and he'll never sleep or slumber on you. He'll hold your hand all the way through this and you are going to make it. You're going to come out bold, strong, anointed, an overcomer, strong in the power of Jesus Christ. So pray this prayer with me, everyone. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I make you my Lord and Savior through your Son, Jesus. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner, but I'm now saved by grace. And Lord, I ask you today to come into my heart to change my life. I'm going to go to your house. I'm going to read your book. And the rest of my life will be the best of my life. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Give the Lord a hand for all those people. You see, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> amen.